If you've ever seen a picture of the border between the U.S. and Canada, you know that there's a 20-foot gap between trees that goes all along the 49th parallel from the Pacific Ocean until the Atlantic. I'm showing a picture of it here. I'm a Border Patrol agent. My job is to ride along sections of the border, cutting down any saplings that are starting to grow in that gap, and to look for any illegal activity that might be happening as well. Last week, I went on a three-day excursion along a 400-mile section of the border. Three of us set out on snowmobiles. Myself, an older guy named Brent, and a new hire named John. We carried extra gas, camping supplies, and a satellite phone in case we found anything suspicious. The snow was deep, as I'm sure you can imagine. After a few hours, we were about as far from civilization as you can reasonably be in North America. We stopped every couple of hundred feet to cut down saplings that had been missed in previous excursions. We also made stops if any of us saw any suspicious tracks in the woods. Most everything you'd find this far out into the wilderness was either some very extreme hunters or drug cartels smuggling drugs to Canada. It was getting late on the first day of the trip. I was the lead snowmobile, carving back and forth in the fresh powder, when I saw a shape blocking the path. I pulled my machine off to the side, with Brent and John following my lead. The shape I'd seen was a dead moose that was laying on its side. There was some blood on the ground next to it, but not much. I took a picture of the moose, and I'll show it here. Be warned, it's pretty graphic. Brent walked up to the moose and leaned down next to it. He motioned for me to look. The moose's throat had been cut all the way down to the bone. Brent raised an eyebrow at me. How do you figure that happened, he asked. I told him I didn't know, but that I'd certainly never seen anything like it before. I looked the moose over and saw no other damage than that long, clean cut across its throat. John blew air into his hands to warm them. Maybe it was a bear or wolf. They've got claws, right? He said. Brent looked around at the snowy ground. Does there look like there's enough blood here to you? Because it seems like there's only flecks here and there. He pointed to the head. And next to the throat, there's almost no blood on the snow at all. I realized he was right. Not only that, but whatever had killed it hadn't taken any meat. Just blood, apparently. John looked at the two of us. You guys ever hear of a blood-drinking animal out here before? Brent pointed to the moose. Yep, but I don't think a tick did that. We couldn't find any more clues, so we rode for a few more miles and made camp. I called up the base on our satellite phone and told them we may have found signs of hunters. They made a note, then told me that a storm was coming in and would be hitting later that next day. The night passed without any other incident, and the next morning we set off again. We found a bunch of trees and bushes in the morning, so we wasted a couple of hours hacking at them and cursing the earlier teams that could have dealt with them when they were smaller. We made good time in the afternoon. The border wound up to a rocky mountain where the trees don't grow, so we were allowed to take a detour around the southern base. I took some video of the trail, which you're seeing now. It was fresh powder, so I was having a bit of fun with it. In the video, I'm in front, with Brent and John following behind. Each of us was hauling a small trailer with our extra gas and supplies. As the day ended, the snow started falling heavily. We were eager to make camp and wait out the storm, so we were already looking for a place that might work when John signaled for us to stop. We pulled around, and he pointed to some tracks that had left the borderline and curved farther south into the woods. They were clearly human. We both looked at Brent. He shrugged. I guess we need to check it out, he said. If it's a person living out here, maybe we can sleep inside tonight. If it's drug runners, we'll be prepared. He pulled his rifle off of his machine. He pointed at John. Why don't you keep an eye on our machines while we check this out? We'll radio you if it's anything good. We followed the trail on foot into the woods for around 20 minutes. Eventually, the woods opened up to a clearing. A single-room cabin was visible through the falling snow, with its lights off inside. Brent told me to keep an eye out for extra footprints, and to circle around to meet up on the other side. When we met, neither of us had seen any extra prints. Brent slung his rifle. This guy's probably just some hermit, he said. If it was a cartel, we'd have seen more activity. I told him he was probably right but that it was possible that the falling snow had covered up extra tracks. Brent gave the go-ahead to approach the door. The two of us made our way towards the house, and I yelled out, Customs and Border Protection. There was no answer, and as we got closer, I saw why. The front door was swinging open on its hinges inside the cabin. We climbed up the steps and flashed our lights inside. There was so much blood. Every surface inside the cabin was flecked with it, and there was a pool in the center of the room. There wasn't a body, just blood and the signs of a violent struggle. I walked up to the stove and held my hand next to it. It was still warm to the touch. Brent kicked a piece of cloth into the blood, and it came away wet when he tugged on it. What happened here, he asked. We turned back to the door. I knelt down and saw that something had cut away the wood where the door handle had been. It looked like a huge exacto knife had been taken to it. There were straight, deep lines, crisscrossing all over it and a gaping hole where the handle had been. Brent swore under his breath as he took the door in. 
bear maybe? He asked. I asked him what kind of bear made such perfectly straight cuts. On top of that, what kind of bear knew to attack the handle of the door? We didn't have any answers, and both knew we had to get out of there. I had just gotten back to my feet when I heard it. This unnatural croaking sound echoed from the clearing outside. It sounded like somebody choking, but impossibly loud. Did you hear that, Brent asked? That noise? Me and Brent both pointed our guns at the door and waited, listening hard. The moment passed, and we didn't hear anything other than the wind and falling snow. I told Brent we had to make our way back. We left the cabin and started towards the north where we'd come from. Just before we entered the woods, I thought to take a picture of the cabin, so here that is. The walk back to our machines was tense, to say the least. We didn't hear any more croaking, and made the walk back in half the time. Finally, we got to where we'd left our snowmobiles and found them with John keeping watch. We hopped on our machines and drove for an hour or so. We wanted to be as far from that cabin as possible before we stopped for the night. We made camp and decided to set a watch rotation. I called base and reported what we'd seen in the cabin, and they said that they'd send a helicopter the next day with a team to investigate. I was glad for that. We were not detectives, and none of us had any experience investigating whatever this situation was. We set out early the next morning. I figured we'd make it to base late that night if we made good time. The ride was only occasionally broken up by stopping to cut trees. The mood was tense, and nobody said much during our lunch breaks or while we worked. Pretty soon the sun had dipped below the horizon, and we switched on the snowmobile headlights to see. All three of us wanted to get to a warm bed before the night was over. We were only a few hours away when we pulled off to cut down a few more trees that were creeping over the line. I chopped at the biggest one with a chainsaw I'd brought, while Brent and John were hacking at some of the smaller saplings with machetes. My tree had finally cracked and fallen when Brent called out. I walked over to where he was kneeling down in the snow. He nodded his head towards the ground. I bent over and took a look. It was a print in the snow. It looked like a human hand, but bigger. I noticed long, thin marks running from each finger, which reminded me of bear claws. I took a picture, which I'll show now. That looks like a human hand, doesn't it? Brent said. I told him that I thought it did, except for whatever those claw marks were. Then I heard it again, the impossibly loud croaking from the woods. Guys, John shouted. He was pointing into the woods to our left. I followed his finger and saw a creature standing behind a tree about a hundred feet away. It looked humanoid, but was on all fours with impossibly long arms and legs. It had white skin and fingers that each ended with a long claw. I saw its face. It was covered in dried blood and eyes so red they almost shined in the darkness, and it was staring at us, croaking. I had my phone in my hand already, so I took a picture. I don't know why. I was operating on instinct, I guess. It was dark, so you won't be able to see much, but here it is. The creature started moving towards us, mostly on two legs, but using its hands sometimes, too. We jumped on our snowmobiles and hit the gas before it got close. I rode faster than I'd ever gone before. None of us said a word. We just rode as hard as we could. The ride back to base took another two hours or so, but we didn't slow down until we made it to the station. I quit my job there soon after that. I don't know what they found when they went back to the cabin. It might be something worth looking into. If you've enjoyed this story, you can subscribe below or click here to hear another one. I upload all original stories every Wednesday.